Thank you, Margaret. Good morning, everybody, and thank you all for joining us. Like Margaret mentioned, feel free to turn on your cameras. We'd like to see you, and if not, that's fine too. Um, my name is Wendy Hernandez, and I'm a corporate law clerk with Morella's Family Wealth Group. Um, my work is primarily corporate and tax law. I focus on um, working with exempt organizations and you know, building a diverse transactional practice, which includes um, the cannabis industry. So a little bit of um, how I hope to, uh, uh, the issues that I hope to present on is the application of Prop 65 um, to the cannabis industry. So Don will go ahead and um, give you an overview of what we'll discuss. I will go ahead and you know, give some application. We did see some questions come in regarding the short form warnings and the long form warnings. So we do, I do hope to address those. If for any reason I don't address your questions, feel free to write them into the chat box or ask them at the end. Um, and then uh, I'll go ahead and hand it back to Don who will wrap up the presentation and uh, talk a little bit about the litigation aspects of Prop 65. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Don. Thanks, Wendy, appreciate it. And uh, although Wendy advertises herself as a law clerk, because that's what she is, she's actually a rising associate here at Farella. Just the state bar is taking a long time to process admissions to the bar, unfortunately, much longer than normal because of COVID. But uh, hopefully the next time you see her, she will have bear the title of associate on the website as soon as the state bar gets their, uh, gets their act together and gets her a bar number. Uh, my name is Don Sobelman. I'm a partner in the environmental law practice uh, here at Farella Braun. Uh, I've been practicing in, uh, in San Francisco since uh, joining the bar in 19, uh, 1996, so almost 25 years ago. Uh, almost the entire time I've spent uh, in, that in the environmental space uh, doing environmental compliance, environmental litigation, and uh, contaminated site remediation. Um, the, uh, the Prop 65 is a thread through my practice historically and during that entire time uh, from the time I was a first year associate uh, all the way until now as a partner. Uh, it's a law that uh, continues to evolve over time. Its application uh, to the range, of, the range of products it applies to, the way in which it applies, the way in which warnings need to be given, uh, the way in which it's enforced by the citizen enforcers, which we'll be talking about. So it's, it's a constantly evolving regime. And so I'm uh, very excited to present to you on this. With respect to the cannabis and hemp derived products industry, uh, uh, this presentation uh, will be focused on products uh, warnings and uh, exposures. Uh, there are also in Prop 65 other requirements, for example, for uh, environmental exposures, and there are uh, application of, uh, of the Prop 65 uh, requirements to discharges uh, to the environment, but we won't be covering that. This is just going to be focused really on uh, the Prop 65 warning requirements for uh, products in this industry. So uh, in terms of the topics we're going to be covering, uh, we'll start with an overview of Prop 65 and, and how it applies in this context uh, overall. Then we'll talk briefly about its application to cannabis and hemp-derived products in terms of the recent listings. Uh, then to, uh, I'll turn it over to Wendy, who will talk about the compliance issues with respect to the, to the uh, warnings at issue. Uh, and then uh, I will then come back and talk about the contractual issues uh, that make arise, may arise, as well as uh, enforcement of Prop 65, uh, how that works, what the potential penalties are, and then we'll close uh, with a discussion of how to respond if you do get a notice of an intent to sue uh, from likely a citizen enforcer who, who tend to be the, the persons who enforce the statute. So to start, the Prop 65 mandate is, is, is fairly simple, at least in the way it's worded in this provision here from the California Health and Safety Code, which is that uh, no person in the course of doing business shall knowingly and intentionally expose any individual to a substance known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity without first giving clear and reasonable warning to such individual. Now, of course, what, what seems simple on the page from that statement is actually far more complex in terms of how it plays out in real life. So uh, with respect to, uh, first of all, on the next slide, the scope of Prop 65, the question is, who, who makes these decisions about where, where a warning needs to be given? 
Well, the answer is the state of California has an agency called the Envi Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or as we lovingly refer to it, OEHA, which determines which substances are going to be listed pursuant to Proposition 65 as uh, chemicals known to cause to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. And so uh, there is a list uh, and that list is, is updated and it's available uh, on uh, OEHA's website. And you can see uh, every, every substance that the state has listed over time uh, by name. And also it will list the date that it was listed. And it will, it will also state in the list whether or not it is listed because it has an endpoint of carcinogenicity or reproductive toxicity or both. And, and, a, and many substances are actually listed under both endpoints. And so Prop 65 creates a legal duty to warn exposed individuals about each endpoint for any listed chemical. Next slide. Now, with respect to Prop 65's application to, to the industry, as we're going to be speaking about today, uh, marijuana smoke, as you probably know, was listed as a carcinogen in 2009. Uh, what happened in 2019 was a further listing was made by OEHA uh, that took effect one year later on January 3rd, 2020. I'm sorry, this is actually erroneous. It, the decision was made at January 3rd, 2020. It took effect January 3rd, 2021. Uh, and this, uh, this new listing uh, revised the listing for cannabis, marijuana smoke, so that now it is listed not just as a carcinogen, but also as a reproductive toxin. So now it has both endpoints that need to be warned for. And then also it added for the first time to the list of Prop 65 chemicals, Delta, Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol or Delta 9 THC. Uh, and it is listed only under the reproductive, reproductive toxin endpoint. Uh, with respect to uh, hemp derived products uh, and cannabis, the other thing to keep in mind is that there are other listed chemicals that may be present in your product in this industry. Uh, you know, these are, these are, can be from pesticides. For example, my, mycobutanol is a listed Prop 65 chemical. It can be metals that come from uptake from growing of, of the hemp uh, or from other uh, uh, materials that come into contact with the product. Or if your product, the, the, the cannabis product or hemp derived product is blended with other materials uh, or other chemicals or other ingredients, obviously there could be listed chemicals in those other parts of the product. So for example, metals like mercury and lead are listed. Uh, and so in addition to uh, you know, Delta 9 THC and cannabis smoke being relevant, uh, Prop 65 chemicals that need, you need to be concerned about, uh, lab testing you know, needs to be done with the product, comprehensive lab testing to ensure you have identified any other Prop 65 chemicals that may be present in your product as well. So the next slide. The, in terms of who must warn, uh, the phrase in the statute is person in the course of doing business. And essentially, uh, that warning obligation runs to the entire chain of distribution. Everybody from the manufacturer of the product through the distribution chain with various suppliers, and then all the way down to retailers. Uh, there is an exemption for businesses with nine or fewer employees. So that's it. And that's an important to keep in mind. Uh, however, uh, how that exemption is characterized is important because uh, if your business, for example, is a is a an entity that is affiliated with other corporate entities, there can be questions about, you know, how you count the number of employees that are actually uh, you know, part of the, part of the quote person. Uh, and whether or not uh, you can, you have to aggregate, for example, affiliated corporate entities and making that calculation. Uh, also, I know, I know that at least one person from a public agency signed up for this presentation, and it's important to know that there's also in the definition of person in the course of doing business, an exemption for most public agencies, cities, counties, state of California, uh, and uh, uh, public water supply entities uh, are all exempt as well. Next slide. With respect to compliance generally, uh, in terms of upstream, the manufacturer, uh, supplier, or distributor uh, can, can comply in two ways, uh, either by providing a, a compliant Prop 65 warning on the product label, or if they do not want a label, there is an alternative, which is they can provide specified written notice directly to the business to which they are selling within the chain, so the next person in the chain of distribution. 
uh, and uh, there are, the statute provides uh, specifications for what must be in the written notice that is provided to that next business in the chain. Uh, so long as that next business in the chain is an entity that is subject to Proposition 65. And so generally speaking, that would be someone who employs 10 or more people and has a designated agent for service of process in California or has a place of business in California. Uh, the, the, that second option is one that is not used by most, most uh, manufacturers in particular of products because uh, it obviously presents issues about compliance in terms of, of how that warning may be, may be perceived by the person receiving it, whether or not it, it, they, they actually get it in some way uh, or would claim that they, they somehow lost it or didn't come with the product, uh, but it is available as an option and it's important to keep in mind. With respect to uh, retailer responsibility for providing a warning, statute uh, does uh, provide limitations on that responsibility uh, with the understanding that, you know, it can be very difficult for retailers to be in a position to, uh, you know, the people, and when I say retail, really, that's the, per the person, the last person in the chain, anybody who's the person actually selling it to the consumer for whom the warning should be given. Uh, that you know the retailer really shouldn't be in the position of having to deal with this, especially a retailer that sells numerous products, uh, and, and would have to worry about uh, you know ensuring compliance with the statute. And so the, the statute was was revised over time to ensure that that the retailer can rely on the upstream entities. And so um, the if if the warning is provided by an upstream entity, generally the retailer does not have an obli a separate obligation. Uh, the separate obligation arises in specific instances uh, noted in the statute, which are essentially that, uh, that the, the label, the product was labeled, but the retailer sells it without uh, conspicuously posting or displaying the warning, um, that the retailer somehow uh, you know, did something to the product to introduce a chemical, a listed chemical into the product, or obscured or altered the warning label. Um, you know, these are not things that normally would happen, but obviously it was meant to, you know, the, the state wanted to cover situations where the retailer does something to vitiate the, 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 the warning that was provided by the upstream entity. Uh, also, the retailer uh, is responsible for providing the warning where it sells a product under a brand or trademark owned or licensed by the, the retailer or an affiliate. So that is, uh, comes up usually in the context of private label products. So for example, uh, you know, if you shop at a, a market, you know, Safeway, and they have a, for example, a pizza that's branded as a Safeway brand, um, you know, the, re the retailer in that instance for that private label brand uh, does have an independent obligation to provide a warning, regardless of, of what an upstream entity does. Um, and then finally, uh, in the situation where the retailer has actual knowledge of an exposure requiring a warning, and there is no upstream entity who is subject to Prop 65. So if essentially the, they, are, they are bringing something into the, for example, into the country from a foreign country where the, the foreign entity has no, no connection with California and they're the only business really that is, is within the jurisdiction of California, there is an independent obligation on the retailer as well. Next slide. So the, there is an exemption from the warning requirement other than the 10 person, uh, less than 10 person exemption. Uh, so if you do have an obligation to provide a warning either as an upstream entity or as a retailer or the final seller to the, to the consumer, uh, the, the, what, there is one exception and it is essentially to uh, prove that your product does not pose an unacceptable risk. And so this is uh, based on a, a provision in the statute that uh, allows for a determination to be made of this, of this uh, risk analysis. Uh, OWIHA has promulgated regulations that uh, have a process, contain a process for determining what is a safe exposure level for a listed chemical. Now, there are, this is a very complicated process and it involves uh, an overall review of scientific evidence concerning a chemical. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, it's not a short process. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. Usually it is something that the members of the industry that is affected uh, will propose and, and get involved in at a, high, at, at a detailed level to try to get to see if they can get a number adopted by OEHA that allows them to sell, sell products without a label. Uh, and uh, it, can take, it can take years 
And that even then it's only for a very small number of, of products or I'm sorry, chemicals for which uh, OIHA at any given time can be working on. So even at this time, after the statute has been around uh, for uh, now uh, over 30 years, uh, there still are only uh, in the range of a few hundred of these safe harbor levels that have been, have been uh, promulgated by OIHA, uh, despite there being many, many more times that number of chemicals that are listed. And so the, the two types of numbers that are created are if it's a carcinogen, OIHA will, will, will promulgate what is called a no significant risk level or an NSRL, which is what OIHA believes is the uh, exposure to a product that a consumer can have that will, will not result in uh, one excess lifetime cancer risk per 100,000 persons. Or for a reproductive toxicant, it's a maximum allowable dose level, which is the MADL, which is set by OIHA at 1,000 times the no observable reproductive effect level uh, based on uh, exposure. And the 1,000 time factor is, is meant to make it very conservative, obviously. So they take the level which no effect was seen in the scientific studies, and then they multiply it by 1,000 to ensure that uh, sensitive, sensitive receptors or members of the population who might have special sensitivities are covered and protected. Um, what's important to note is that OEA has not set safe harbor levels for marijuana smoke or THC. Uh, they are available for things, things like certain metals like lead, uh, but marijuana smoke or THC at this point do not have a safe harbor level set by OEA. And that's something obviously that the industry uh, will need to consider going forward. Uh, because uh, not having that level determined by OIHA means that essentially there's no there's no argument no argument at this point that you know what the number is below which you don't you know don't need a warning. It's going to require an independent assessment every time uh, someone is challenged over whether or not they're providing an adequate warning. But one can try to do that, and so you can do it by doing a safe use exposure assessment uh, without. The, there being an NSRL or an MADL, uh, you can do it by trying to develop it yourself. Uh, and this is where you essentially would uh, take all the scientific, you have a, you would hire consultants uh, and usually a lawyer to work with you on this to first figure out what is an NSRL or an MADL for that, for the constituent. Uh, so for example, THC, uh, by, by reviewing the evidence and compiling it and, and, and coming up with what uh, one believes is a scientifically defensible number. Uh, that number though uh, is going to be expressed as a, uh, essentially an exposure, which is uh, what's the exposure to the product per day? How many micrograms of, of I'm sorry, of the chemical per day are, are you being exposed to? Uh, and, with respect to that, so once you get the NSRL or the MADL and it's set in, you know, micrograms of the chemical per, per day, uh, you know, how do you apply that to the product? Uh, because then uh, with the product, you're looking at, you know, the concentration, which is micrograms per gram, which is a separate, separate unit. Uh, how do you translate those two things in terms of what the level is in your product versus what is a safe use exposure. And that essentially involves then taking the NSRL and MADL and then applying uh, various other assumptions about, uh, first of all, you know, what, what is the exposure? Is it, is it by skin, dermal, by being something rubbed on, inhalation, is it ingestion through eating or drinking? Uh, is it multiple, are there multiple routes of exposure depending on the product? Uh, and then what is the reasonably expected consumption of the product? So is this a product that's going to be used, you know, once a day, three times a day, once a week? Um, it, and when it's used, how much is going to be consumed of that product uh, in that usage? Uh, and then what would be the, you know, level, uh, and would the level change over time, depending on, on how the product is composed? And so this can be a time-consuming and costly analysis. And uh, ultimately you may do that and the results may confirm that for your specific product, uh, that a warning is required, that, that the NSRL or MADL that you believe is appropriate is actually below the exposure that your product causes. So because of this, um, you know, at least until there is an NSRL or, or MADL for a, for a chemical, uh, usually, P, uh, people in the business of selling a product that has a listed chemical 
uh, are not going to find it cost effective to try to do this, this safe use exposure assessment for, for their product, particularly if they have a line of products where they would have to do it for every single one of their products that have a different composition. Um, and at the end of the day, even if they do do it and it turns out it's favorable and they believe they don't need a warning, that still doesn't stop someone from uh, challenging it via an enforcement action and challenging the analysis uh, and challenging the assumptions that underlie it. And so you can end up with a situation where you may have done the analysis, spent the money, determined that you have a, a, a good argument, but if you do get challenged on it, you're still stuck in, the, in a litigation posture of having to have essentially uh, a battle of the experts and potentially having to litigate the issue to prove you were right. So um, especially until, like I said, until we have sets a number, um, you know, most people are not gonna find it cost-effective to take this approach. That said, obviously with the new listing of THC, something for the industry to think about of, of, of hemp-derived products and cannabis is whether as a, a broader industry, uh, it makes sense to perhaps undertake an effort to, to, to establish an MADL uh, for THC uh, as a reproductive toxicant uh, and get OEH, OEH to adopt it uh, to allow this type of assessment to be uh, a, a more of an option on a product by product basis. Okay. So I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy at this point, who's gonna talk a bit now about Prop 65 warnings. Thanks, Don. So there are two types of methods to provide Prop 65 warnings that the statute provides. Um, the first for in-person transactions and the second for internet sales. So for internet trans um, in-person transactions, the warning must be posted, a posted sign um, as a shelf tag or a shelf sign at each point of display. Um, electronic or device processes or devices that um, automatically provide warnings like tags um, that provide the warning prior to or during the purchase and does not require the purchaser to seek out the warning. So for the statute um, provides that um, these uh, electronic devices, um, including uh, the tags and labels, must provide um, uh, all of, must provide the Prop 65 warning for um, the in-person transaction. There was a question that came in um, that one of you all submitted prior to the presentation regarding uh, one of the signs and whether a sign can be displayed at the front of a store. And so, um, like I read off the, the part of the slide, the statute provides that there should be a warning at each point of display. So if there's just one sign at the front of a store, um, that likely won't be sufficient. Um, the statute does provide that the warning should be available to the consumer without requiring the purchaser to seek out the warning. It should be available for them to see um, what is, uh, you know, they're being exposed to by buying the product. And for internet sales, which are becoming more and more common now with companies like um, Ease and um, Weed Map, uh, this, the, the warning uh, method is similar and um, should be clearly displayed on the product's display page or hyperlinked um, to the warning. And the warning should be prominently displayed prior to completing the purchase. So similar to the in-person transaction where a person walking up to a storefront shouldn't be looking for a Prop 65 warning, it should be available for them to see. The internet sell um, shouldn't be something uh, or someone purchasing something online shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't have to look for the warning. So um, when they have the display, the, the web page available and they're looking at the product, they should be able to see right next to the product or a hyperlink right next to the product that takes them to the Prop 65 warning. And I see a question coming in regarding the exact language. So Margaret, can you go ahead and go to the next slide? We'll get to the language specifically. Um, the standard for the warning is that it should be a clear and reasonable warning. Um, there should be a, at least one or more listed chemicals regarding the warning. And this is um, the one or more listed chemical is different for the short form warning, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, it should be prominently displayed. So there is some conspicuousness um, regarding prominently displayed compared to other words likely to be seen, read and understood. But like I mentioned, um, prominently displayed, you know, for the to 
um, and on safe side should be available to the to the consumer. So someone walking up to a storefront who can actually see the warning. Um, importantly for uh, for the industry and hemp derived products, the warning should be provided in all languages that's used for the consumer information. So if the product is being displayed or being marketed in um, a language other than English, the warning as well should be provided in the language that it's being marketed for. So um, this includes supplemental information that, you know, identifying the source of exposure and providing information on how to avoid or reduce the exposure. Can you go to the next slide, Margaret? Uh, so the long awaited uh, sample language and just as a general um, I'm sure you all know this, but just as a general reminder, we are providing educational um, uh, material. We're not provide. We're not. We don't want you to walk away and take this language and copy and paste it onto your label. Um, but this is, um, you know, meant to help you come up with, with your own warnings. So for the general um, standard or long form warning, the statute provides that there's um, three basic elements. So. Um, and this is reading directly from the statute. Um, pull that up. A symbol consisting of a black exclamation point in a yellow equilateral triangle with a bold black outline. So it's very specific, and you know we did our our best to provide that example. Um, there's also the option to provide the symbol to be printed in black and white. So um, you know yellow is included in the statute, but also black and white. The warning um, should be in all caps locks um, and bolded in the same or smaller font. So um, the warning sign should be listed or the warning, the word warning should be listed next to the exclamation in an equilateral triangle. And of course, uh, you know, a permutation of what the war what the what the warning is being made to, right? So as Don discussed. The uh, Prop 65 does create a legal duty to warn, so you need your your warning needs to be very um, clear. And so, you know, permutation of this product can expose you to chemicals, including, for example, if this was a, a product that only had delta nine THC, which, as Don mentioned, only um, has been listed as a chemical for reproductive harm. That is what you would, you know, this product can expose you to chemicals, including Delta 9 THC, which is known for reproductive harm in the state of California and, um, you know, some type of permutation of that type of language and including the website um, for more information. So that's uh, generally the long form warning. If the um, warning is using, if you're using a short form warning, um, similarly, there are three basic elements the same equilateral triangle and the warning sign. The font here can be smaller. It can be a six point font. Um, and in this case, you don't need to list the exact chemical that you're being um, exposed to, like in the long form, you wanna be um, posting just, um, you're just warning to what, what the actual harm that they're being exposed to. So cancer or reproductive harm or any other chemicals that are included in the product that have a different type of harm. So something to keep in mind for the short form warning is that it is undergoing modification. The Office of Environmental Health and Hazard Assessment um, released a revised regulation for public comment. It's actually live now. Um, and the comment period closes on March 29th. Um, and so the regulation you know, provides that um, the short form warning will have to be used where five, where there is the product is a five square inches or less of label space. Um, it will eliminate the use of the short form warning for internet sales, meaning that your hyperlink or your warning on your webpage will have to use the long form warning um, and requiring naming at least one chemical. Um, so this is important to keep in mind because this, um, you know, this, the grace period that ended and just kind of expired on the first of, of this year um, may only be um, phased in for a year. We may see, you know, um, we're gonna still see a phase in period for any modifications that are made, but um, there probably will be some modifications. So if you have, you know, some concern, we do encourage you to um, 
provide or provide some comment. We did provide um, all of this information and all the material in um, the materials that Margaret sent beforehand. Uh, so the entire revised regulation is um, included there. We do hope that you know this is something that is of interest to you that you take the time and the initiative to comment. Um, and keep in mind, right? Uh, and there's you know pun it, com complete pun intended in that warning sign at the title of the slide. Um, there probably will be um, some type of changes regarding the short form warning um, in the next year or so. You can go to the next slide. And I'll go ahead and hand it back to Don, who's gonna talk about contractual issues. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so I, I want to talk briefly about contractual issues. This is something that you know is going to lend itself more to a one-on-one -on -one discussion with, with, with folks if they're interested in this. And I'm happy to follow up if anyone wants to, to chat afterwards. Um, or you know, in terms of you know, once you get to the point of actually drafting contracts or reviewing contracts for products, should be discussed with your with your legal counsel uh, to, to talk about these issues and make sure that you're covered. So uh, this really is for anybody within the chain of distribution. So whether you're at the, the point of sale to the consumer or whether you're the manufacturer or somewhere in between uh, is really first, you know, basically based on understanding, um, you know, what is the applicability of Prop 65 to the product at issue? Uh, once everybody understands what that is, presumably, you know, you'll, you'll know it's because your product has, say, THC in it, you've run the tests, you know it does or does not contain other listed Prop 65 chemicals. Um, address this directly in the contract, uh, address, uh, clarify what are the known Prop 65 listed chemicals in the product. Um, and then allocate responsibility for compliance. Uh, you know, again, this is gonna depend where you are, depending on where you are in the chain, everybody will have different, uh, you know, legal postures on this and incentives um, on how they wanna handle this. But uh, it's, if the contract can clearly allocate that responsibility, uh, within the chain of distribution, it will be best for all parties in case down the road there's ever any dispute about who had that responsibility. And then finally, uh, indemnification for any liability and legal fees resulting from a failure to comply with Prop 65, as well as any obligation to defend uh, an enforcement action and how that defense works. Uh, often contracts will have a, some kind of boilerplate uh, language about indemnification that's very brief does not provide much in the way of detail. Uh, those provisions can often cause problems when you get into an enforcement context because it becomes unclear. For example, with a defense, uh, you know, if someone uh, has an indemnification obligation uh, and a defense obligation, do they have an obligation, for example, to pay for that other party's attorney separately or can they retain counsel to represent both parties, one, one set of lawyers? Um, you know, what, are the, what are the parameters for reimbursement? Etc. Uh, usually having a detailed indemnification provision that uh, clearly spells out what the conditions are for an indemnity, whether it covers defense costs up front or reimbursement on the back end, does it, you know, how, how counsel are retained, et cetera. Uh, it's best to have that in the contract up front to ensure that once an enforcement action is filed, the parties can quickly figure out who's going to be defending it, you know, what are the, what's the relationship going to be, what are the obligations of the various parties. Uh, it will make makes life a lot easier for everybody involved, whether it's the indemnity or the indemnitor, uh, as well as uh, given the time frame we'll talk about momentarily for addressing a compliance issue. Uh, usually, you're going to want to sort this out very quickly so that you can move forward with substantively defending against the claim. So, talking about enforcement, the um, the Prop 65 statute provides that enforcement actions can be filed by the California Attorney General, a district attorney in a county, uh, and even city attorneys in large cities in California, but also has a private uh, citizen enforcement uh, provision where private persons who are acting in the public interest can also enforce where the government has not stepped in. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is rare for a government entity to file a Prop 65 case, uh, mostly because, for two reasons, I think. One is lack of resources, just not, not enough uh, funding and personnel to really focus on these issues at any level of the government. Uh, and secondly, because there is a vigorous private enforcement uh, that goes on by these citizen enforcers, 
uh, it's generally, I think, understood at the city and county and state level that uh, anybody who is not providing a warning for a product that contains a Prop 65 listed chemical sooner or later is going to get uh, caught in an enforcement action by a, pri by a private enforcer because uh, literally uh, thousands of these uh, thousands of these enforcement actions are initiated every year by private parties. Uh, the California Attorney General does actually oversee the private enforcers, though, at a pretty significant level, and we'll talk about that momentarily. But uh, as the penalties can range up to twenty five hundred dollars per day per violation, and uh, citizen enforcers can and they will seek recovery of their attorney's fees. Uh, Prop 65 does not have a provision in itself that governs this, but the general provision of California Code of Civil Procedure 1021.5 addressing recovery of attorney's fees in private, uh, private party actions to enforce public rights does apply in Prop 65 cases. And so often, uh, the, especially if, if these enforcement actions get litigated for any significant period of time, the amount of the attorney's fees claimed by a citizen enforcer will greatly exceed likely the penalties that would end up getting paid. So that's something to keep in mind. So uh, if, the, if, if civil penalties are considered by a court uh, in the context of a legal action, uh, there are a number of enumerated factors that should be, cut, should be considered. Uh, and they're the ones you would expect, the nature and extent of the violation, how many violations, was there an economic benefit for the violator by not providing a warning? Uh, did the violator take good faith measures to comply or was it intentional? Uh, and then also, you know, what, you know, taking into account the deterrent effect. And then of course the catch-all that means, means anything can come into play, any other factor that justice may require. And so really a court considering civil penalties can, can consider whatever it wants when, when looking at this issue. But usually these cases aren't going to end up in court. Go to the next slide. Uh, what happens with a case is that there's not, a, it's not a, someone doesn't just show up and file a case in court. Uh, the statute provides that the, uh, the entity, uh, the, if, a, if a private party is going to enforce as a citizen enforcer, that they first must serve a notice of the alleged violation and of their intent to file suit at least 60 days before initiating the actual court enforcement action by filing the complaint. So this notice needs to be served on the alleged violator and on all the, those public enforcers that I mentioned on the prior slide. Uh, so the attorney general gets notice of it as well as the district attorneys get notice of it. Uh, and uh, basically this is provides the government a chance to step in and take over if for some reason the government feels like it, this is a case where they, they feel it's appropriate for the government to step in. Now this is actually pretty rare for that to happen. So it's, it's generally pro forma. But there are instances where, uh, after reviewing the notice, the attorney general in particular will step in and tell the enforcer that for one reason or another, they don't believe the case has merit and ask them to withdraw it, or they can take it over if they believe that they want to. Uh, and the notice needs to, that the citizen enforcer provides must include what's called a certificate of merit in which they, they sign uh, and attest, uh, in, and this is an attestation that is is enforceable in court that they have determined that there is a factual, a, a, a reasonable factual basis for the claim they're bringing, which usually means that they have done a testing of the product and found uh, the listed chemical uh, at e either, if, if there is no uh, MADL or NSRL, they found the the, that the chemical is present, or if there is an, an MADL or an NSRL for the chemical at issue, that they have found it at a level that they believe results in an exposure above that level. And uh, what's important to note is that these notices are publicly posted by the attorney general. So regardless of what happens down the road with that notice, uh, it is public information. And so, for example, if it's your product that's at, at issue, you should be aware that, that you know, it, could, it could be known uh, immediately as soon as it's posted by your customers or others that your product is alleged to be in violation of Prop 65 by having a listed chemical and the, uh, the listed chemical is, is stated in the notice that, 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 the, that is the basis of the, the action. Uh, also, what's important to know is that if, if your case does settle, which we will talk about momentarily, uh, those settlements are also public information. And so uh, again, your customers and others 
will know if they choose to look for it. It's on the Attorney General's website and it's, it's not too difficult to find if you know the name of the company uh, or the name of the, uh, or, or if they're looking for the, the chemical at issue, um, they can figure it out that you did settle this claim. And so it's important to keep in mind that whatever you do in response to this action, if it's in a settlement, you know, it's not going to be kept confidential. It's not going to be something that generally is going to avoid uh, public scrutiny. Although the settlement communications leading up to the actual settlement will remain confidential, but what's actually in the settlement agreement itself will be public information. So in terms of what settlements look like, uh, generally speaking, uh, there are a number of, of citizen enforcers who bring these claims. I mean, I think last time I checked, there were about 30 who were active in California and filing, you know, repeated, you know, either, uh, you know, 50 or more, 100 or more, sometimes, you know, 500 or more of these notices a year. I mean, there's, there's probably in the range of 25 to 30 who fall into that category. And, uh, and they, uh, they are active and, and generally they are, they are, once they get into it, they will continue doing it year after year. And then there are new actors who come in. So for example, uh, one enforcer showed up, started, started sending notices in 2020. We haven't seen them before. In 2020 of January, they started, they started sending notices. And I think as of today, about 14 months later, they've sent about 350. So they were averaging almost one a day uh, in the time they've been doing this. Um, and then some have been around doing this for 20 years and they're still in the business of doing it. And so uh, it's a robust uh, group of, of plaintiffs and plaintiffs lawyers and plaintiffs law firms. And usually there's a lot at law firms that have developed uh, essentially a, a practice of how they handle these cases and the settlements that they do fall within a certain range. So generally what you will see in a settlement uh, will be the same, the, these basic terms, which are that you, uh, the product will not be sold after a certain date. Sometimes it's the date of the agreement, the settlement agreement. Sometimes it's a date that is set that will take place sometime after the settlement agreement, um, unless the product has been reformulated to remove the listed chemical, or if, it, if that chemical ha has a, an NSRL or an MADL, there, there might be a term in there that says that you can sell it if it contains a, it kept the chemical up to a certain level, so well, you can demonstrate that you meet that standard. Or if you're not gonna reformulate it to meet that standard, that there's a warning provided, either the long form or the short form. So that will usually be the main uh, substantive provision in terms of what you're going to have to do for your product. It's either reformulate it to get rid of the chemical or lower the level to where it's appropriate or provide the warning. Uh, there are sometimes the enforcers will ask you to maintain records that relate to, to this, especially on the reformulation front, and either report affirmatively to the enforcer about what you've done or just maintain, sometimes just passively maintain the records and if the enforcer asks, you're ready to show them. Um, and that can involve, for example, on reformulation, if you don't provide the warning, they may ask that you test on some periodic basis to ensure that, that you have actually eliminated or reduced the, the constituent uh, chemical that issue. And then uh, usually the other two elements will be the monetary elements, which is there will be a civil penalty uh, payment that is negotiated as part of the settlement. And then part of that goes to the state of California, part of it goes to the enforcer. And then there will be a payment of the enforcer's attorney's fees and costs. Um, and that the state does not get any of that. That goes straight to the enforcer and their attorney. And uh, generally speaking, uh, what we'll, and I'll talk about this in a bit, is that we'll see is that the attorney's fees and costs are usually, usually exceed the civil penalty. Sometimes they exceed the civil penalty by a great deal. Uh, and so one of the key uh, elements of a settlement is to, to really try to evaluate the a settlement quickly to see if you can keep the enforcer's attorney's fees down if you're going to settle, because uh, that is what, uh, what the cost of a settlement will be driven by how much, how much effort they put into it. Um, and in exchange uh, for all of the above uh, that we've just discussed, uh, what you will get is a release of claims uh, that arise from that 60 day notice. And usually the release will cover, uh, you, well should cover, and you should negotiate it if it's not offered, is a release of all the parties in the chain of distribution, not, not the party that's actually just negotiating this, but everybody upstream and downstream who has sold the product. And, and it should cover all the products that have been sold through the date of the settlement agreement. And then going forward through the date, if there is a date certain later that for the product to be reformulated, to cover that period all the way up until that 
that, that date, if it's after the date of the settlement agreement. So just to give people an idea um, of what's happened in the past uh, in this space, we did a, a quick search to look at what the numbers were for marijuana smoke uh, notice, citizen enforcer notices, um, and found the, what you see here on this chart, which is that um, somewhat like other industries, enforcers will sometimes in a given year decide to pick on a certain industry or a certain focus on a certain type of product. Uh, and really focus their efforts on that. So they'll go and start, you know, like like an example I gave before was, you know, they'll start going and buying frozen pizzas everywhere to test all the frozen pizzas to see what they look like. Uh, or in the, in the year 2017, as you can see here, it looks like someone, one or more enforcers decided they were going to start focusing on marijuana smoke as a, as a chemical of concern. And so you can see it can fluctuate fairly wildly in terms of the number of, of notices that are filed against a, 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 in a specific space. Um, but the, this gives you a sense of, of the numbers that, that we generally see, which are the civil penalties in cases, you know, are often you know, a few thousand dollars in the range of somewhere between uh, you know, a thousand and, and fifteen thousand uh, dollars. And attorney's fees will generally range higher than that. The attorney's fees will range somewhere north of $10,000 to somewhere into the multi tens of thousands, up to 50, 40, 50, 60,000, sometimes depending on uh, how long uh, the negotiations take, uh, whether and especially whether or not uh, a complaint is filed and active litigation ensues before the settlement occurs, it can often be a factor that drives up the, drives up the attorney's fees. Uh, the other factor that often comes into pl play is how much of the product was sold. So generally speaking, the enforcers will ask for a, a higher payment level, uh, both for civil penalties and, and it will spill over into the attorney's fees, usually depending on uh, if the product is one that had major sales in California versus perhaps its product that had de minimis sales. Um, you know, what we'll, what we'll see, see is that, uh, you know, usually as in all settlements where there's a perception that a, a party you know, made a lot of money off of a product that often drives the demand higher. Um, okay, so next slide. So I wanted to wrap up the active presentation before questions with a uh, just kind of a brief discussion about how to handle a private uh, action, 60 day notice if you get one. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's important to act quickly uh, because uh, what happens is the, these enforcers at the end of the 60 day period, if you have not made contact with them and entered into some kind of good faith discussion of their claim, almost always, not always, but almost always, they will file a lawsuit. Now I know a lot, a lot of people get these notices in the mail and I've heard this many times, which is they think it's just some kind of maybe empty threat. Maybe it's, you know, that, that there's this, maybe there's phishing and they send out a bunch of these and they hope people will go and negotiate with them. But if they, if people don't respond that somehow, there will be no follow-up. And you know, I caution people, clients and, and potential clients about that and tell them you know, that wishful thinking is not a legal strategy. Uh, and it's particularly in this case because uh, this, is, this is a case of a, of a very uh, well-structured group of uh, private enforcers who are uh, essentially doing this day in and day out. And it, it is something they take seriously. And you, you should assume that there will be consequences if you do not engage with them in that 60 day period. So usually what we try to do uh, for our clients and, and is to use that 60 day period to do a, a number of things, which is first, as we talked about earlier, to identify and enforce any right to defense and indemnification that there may be for, from another party in the distribution chain. So for example, if, 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 it's the, if the retailer is the one that got the, the 60 day notice, because for example, maybe it was their name on the product, maybe it's a private label product, um, that um, you know, they go and look at their contracts and determine, you know, presumably they were indemnified. Most retailers are by the distributor of the product to them or the manufacturer if, they, if it comes directly from the manufacturer and then tender that claim and enforce it uh, so that uh, the retailer is not in the position of having to defend it and, and expend their, their resources on it. Uh, similarly, if someone's farther up the chain, they need to look and see whether ultimately there's someone even farther up the chain that they can go to to, to indemnify and defend. Uh, and to sort that out very quickly so that essentially lawyers can be retained by the appropriate party and can start doing the rest of these items, which are 
you know, first to determine whether the claim has a factual basis. Um, you know, looking at it, usually uh, the things that can be done fairly quickly are uh, first for the uh, for the uh, party uh, who's being who's received the 60 day notice uh, through their legal counsel to commission their own testing. I mean, have the product that was that was purportedly tested by the, the enforcer tested yourself by by your own lab that can be retained to do this. And there are many labs out there who can do Prop 65 you know, testing. Uh, to determine whether or not, in particular, if you can find the same batch of the product, that's optimal if, if you actually can find the actual batch they tested. But if not, try to test the, you know, a batch that was manufactured as close in time to that one and to see whether or not you get comparable results. Because sometimes you will find that your own testing does find the chemical at, you know, at some level that, that obviously would support a Prop 65 claim. Uh, that's important information to have. Uh, however, sometimes you might find it doesn't. You might find that you don't find the chemical, and that can be very valuable information to have for the negotiations and where the case may go. Um, also, to verify with the enforcer in the initial discussion, try to obtain from them as much information as you can about what, they, what the factual basis of their claim is. So, for example, uh, ask them for proof about the product they tested. So if you, they've got, sometimes they, they photograph it. So they'll have photos of the actual specific product. Ask them for the batch number. If there is some, you know, identifying information of, you know, the, the production number, the batch number, whatever you can use to identify, for example, like I said, the, the actual, you know, if you can find your own, you know, uh, item from that batch to test yourself and to confirm uh, where they purchased it. Uh, you know what specific which specific store to make sure that uh, that you can line up that 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 batch they say that they bought was actually sent to that store, for example, uh, and then to get their testing information, uh, get their testing results from their lab, and if they're willing to provide it, ask them in particular not just for the lab result, which is usually just one page that lists you know we'll say you know lead. 15 parts per billion, um, but ask them for the backup documentation. When labs, when labs run tests, they generate a whole bunch of documentation to support that, including quality assurance and quality control uh, documentation uh, that is necessary uh, under their uh, licensing requirements. Try to get as much of it as you can from the enforcer uh, and often uh, either legal counsel or in conjunction with a, an expert who can be retained can review that information to determine whether or not the testing is valid. In particular, if you've done your own testing and found that you didn't find the, the chemical issue in your product, uh, comparing that, you know, trying to understand, is there some reason why maybe the testing that was done by the citizen enforcer was faulty? Uh, and you know, once you've got a handle on that, um, either you might have a basis to ask the enforcer to withdraw the notice uh, by saying that there really is no factual basis and that 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 their certificate of merit was was actually incorrect and you know they could be held accountable in court for it um, or you might find that it looks like they do have a factual basis for the claim in which case really you need to go to the next step fairly quickly and determine whether or not um, reformulation is something that is feasible uh, a lot of clients will just will say um, yeah i mean we've looked at it and we can reformulate the product in a way that we can get it. We won't need to provide a warning. And that, that's valuable information, again, for the negotiation about what the settlement terms are going to look like. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, many people don't want to provide warnings if they don't have to because uh, you know, they think it would affect uh, the perception of their product or sales if they're warning of a carcinogenic effect or reproductive toxicity. So you know, having that early discussion about reformulation is important to see whether that is an option. Uh, and if not, then then starting the discussion about warnings, for example, with the, for example, if you're the distributor of the product and you've decided you can't, or the manufacturer, and it's been determined it can't be reformulated, then you're going to want to probably talk to the retailer, for example, and say, you know, hey, we're thinking of warning. Is that a problem for you? Do you view this as a perception problem to have a warning on this product if you're going to be selling it? Um, so you need to have those discussions about both prongs to, to make sure that you've got a sense of where you want to head. When you have the negotiation with the with the enforcer, um, and then you know ultimately the the last two options are are you either just dropping the product uh, if you can't reformulate and nobody wants to provide a warning, um, you know one option is to not sell it in California anymore, and that that can sometimes be a strategic choice for clients. They'll say that I don't make enough money off this product; it's not worth it for me. I'm just going to drop it, either from California or nationwide. Um, or if if it is a big seller, they might they might decide okay. 
I don't, I want to keep selling it. I can't reformulate. A warning is not an option. I actually think litigating this makes sense, that there might be grounds. It's worth it for me as a business to expend the resources to litigate this issue. It's rare that that's the case we find for our clients, but there are times where that can be uh, an option. Uh, but if it's, if it's not, what you want to do is decide, hopefully within the 60 days, if that's the route you want to go down. If you don't want to go down that road, then the key is to then try to negotiate a prompt settlement uh, before, uh, they, before the 60 days ends optimally. Uh, usually, if you can do that, you can keep the attorney's fees fairly low. Um, and you and 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 get a prompt settlement that resolves it uh, quickly for your client for the client. Um, but sometimes it will take longer than the 60 days and usually the enforcers will be flexible about not filing a lawsuit as long as they see there's good faith progress being made toward the made towards the settlement. So the key is really by the end of the 60 day period is you may not have settled it by then, but to have have developed a strategy, determined whether litigation makes sense, and if not, at least be in the process of the negotiation so that, you know, there isn't going to be the, you know, the enforcer is not going to feel the need just to file a complaint just to preserve their rights. So that's generally uh, our thoughts on the topic. Uh, we're at the end of the hour, but, um, you know, we're happy to answer questions 